Let's pray. Allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The scripture reading this morning, Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, points us in the direction of an important truth. That truth, God is everywhere. God is everywhere. Now, let's be honest this morning. You don't need a pastor. You don't need a preacher. You don't need someone who teaches theology to point this out to you. Right up there with John 3.16 is this realization that God is omnipresent. I have been teaching for a number of years a general education basic Christian theology course. And in the years that I've taught this course, I don't know that I've ever had a student, believer or unbeliever, who didn't know that Christians believe that God is everywhere. But the problem is, while people understand that God fills all time and all space and He transcends all time and all space, they fail to recognize some of the finer nuances to God's omnipresence. And what I want to do as we prepare our hearts, as we prepare our lives to come to the Lord's table, I want to spend a few moments reflecting on some of the finer nuances to God's omnipresence. First, most of my students and most Christians and many evangelicals, when they think of God's presence, while recognizing that he is everywhere, they naturally think that he is everywhere in the same way. They have a natural tendency of thinking that the same way that God is present in an athletic field is the same way that God is present in a coffee shop. And the same way that God is present in our homes and God is present in our dorm rooms is the same way that God is present in worship. But the truth is... While God is everywhere, He is not everywhere in the same way. There are some times and some places where God is present in a way that is different than other times and other places. This nuance to omnipresence is something that is borne out by the clear testimony of Scripture. In the Old Testament, you may remember in Exodus chapter 3... Moses receives his call on Mount Sinai. God comes to him in a burning bush. While God at that time is everywhere in the world, filling the earth, he is on Mount Sinai. He is in the burning bush at that time and that place in a way that is different than anywhere else in the world. Later on, the children of Israel will be delivered out of Egypt and they will make their camp at the base of Mount Sinai. And while God is everywhere in the world for the 11 months that Israel is there, God is present in a way that is different than anywhere else in the world. Solomon is going to build the temple in Jerusalem. Make no mistake... God is present in all of Israel. He is present in all of Jerusalem. God is present in the outer courts. God is present in the inner courts. But God is present in the Holy of Holies in a way that is different than anywhere else in the world. This same truth is testified to in the New Testament. You will remember Saul who will become the Apostle Paul. On the road to Damascus, he will have an encounter with Jesus Christ. He will have a divine appointment. While God is everywhere in the world, at that time and in that place, God is present in a way that is different. This understanding of omnipresence is the only thing that helps us to understand Jesus' statement in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in their midst. 
Jesus, by virtue of his divine nature, is everywhere. But when sisters and brothers in Christ gather together in his name, he is present in their midst in a way that is different. One of the problems that we face in the church and in larger evangelicalism today is that we have lost the distinction between the secular and the sacred. At my former institution, I heard uh, one of the administrators get up in a faculty meeting and say in the faculty meeting, well, as Christians, you all know that we, we don't believe that there's any distinction between the secular and the sacred. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't know what theology you're drinking from. But my theology tells me that there is an important distinction. Let me be clear. Jesus is Lord over all. Make no mistake, God is present. And God reigns and rules over the secular. But there is something about the sacred. And what makes it sacred is the fact that God is present in a way that is different. The difference between the secular and the sacred isn't that God is absent in one and present in the other. The difference is how God is present. Just to illustrate this a little bit more. Make no mistake that God is present in hell. The difference between heaven and hell is not that God is absent in one and present in the other. The difference between hell and heaven is how God is present. What makes the sacred sacred is how God is present. And he is present in a way that is different. It is this theology of omnipresence that informs our understanding of sacred time and sacred space. It is this understanding of omnipresence that helps us to understand what revival is. What is revival? Revival is nothing more, nothing less than when God is in our midst in a way that is different than the way that he is ordinarily in our midst. He is in our midst in such a way that we are brought to repentance. We are brought to faith. We are brought to an amendment of life and we are brought to a new life and a new level of reality in Christ Jesus. It is this understanding of omnipresence that is at the very heart of our theology of worship. It's the very foundation of it. For we recognize that when we come together as sisters and brothers in Christ, that God is present in our midst in a way that is different than the way that he is ordinarily present. I want to say as we prepare our hearts and our lives for Holy Communion that God is present with us in Holy Communion in a way that is different. Regardless of whether you understand Holy Communion as transubstantiation or you understand it as consubstantiation or you understand it as spiritual presence Undergirding all of those different theologies of what Holy Communion is, is the recognition that Jesus, by virtue of his divine nature, is present in our midst in a way that is different. Oh, my sisters and brothers, as we gather here today, our Lord is present among us in a way that is different. But a second nuance to omnipresence is that when God is present in our midst in a way that is different it requires us to be present differently as well or as I heard a good friend of mine once say when God shows up differently we must show up differently as well and again this is a testimony that's borne out in scripture You remember 
And I mentioned earlier Moses on Mount Sinai. God made clear to Moses that this was not ordinary time. This was not ordinary space. He said to Moses, Moses, you are standing on holy ground. And because you're standing on holy ground, you can't treat it just like you would any other space. Moses, take off your shoes. Take off your sandals. In the temple in Jerusalem, the high priest once a year would enter into the Holy of Holies. And if you remember, if that high priest was not ready to enter into the Holy of Holies, if he was not prepared to go into that manifest Shekinah glory of God, then there was a good possibility his life would be taken from him. He had to show up differently. And that type of God's presence. And we also see that this is true in the New Testament as well. When Saul, who will become the Apostle Paul, meets our Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, you will read in Acts that he falls immediately on the ground, on his face, in that type of God's presence. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul talks about the Corinthian church and they're coming to the Lord's table in a way that is unworthy, in a way that is irreverent. They are treating the Lord's table like they would any other ordinary meal, any ordinary fellowship. And because they are not showing up differently, the Apostle Paul says that some among them have fallen asleep. Some among them have become sick. One of the most important nuances to omnipresence is that when God is present in our midst in a way that is different, we must show up differently as well. Now, I've been a part of a Christian university for the last 16 years. And at both institutions where I have served, we have had mandatory chapel. You don't have that here at Asbury Theological Seminary, but at Asbury University, at Indiana Wesleyan University, required chapel. And many students I know who love Jesus, who would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, because they don't understand some of the finer nuances of chapel, when they arrive at chapel, they treat chapel like they would any other ordinary time, ordinary space. Many Christian students use this as an opportunity to catch up on their sleep. They use it as an opportunity to study for their upcoming exams. They, have, they use it as an opportunity to catch up on social media, catch up with their friends, talk about what's going on in their lives. They treat it just like any other space, any other time. And because they treat it like this, they often miss the moment that God wants to do something great in their lives. I have students who come into my office at my heart. I'm a pastor at my heart. I am a preacher. And I have students who come into my office and they will talk about strongholds of sin in their life. They will talk about deep woundedness and deep brokenness in their hearts and in their lives. And one of the things that I say to them is this. Could it be when God is in our midst in a way that is different... That he is ready at certain times and certain places. Ready to set you free from your bondage. Ready to bring healing and wholeness to your heart and to your life. But because you treat that time and that place like any other time and place. You miss the moment. And you fail to receive the grace that God wants to make available to you. In that sacred time and sacred space. 
I had a good friend when I was a student at Asbury University he used to say this. She said, when God is throwing a banquet, don't be on a diet. When God is throwing a feast, that is not the time to skimp. That is not the time to hold back. But it is to jump right in and take full advantage of what God is making available to you in the moment. Now, some important things about this. There are times and places that become holy ground. There are times and places that become sacred time and sacred space. And you don't know and don't anticipate it's coming. It just happens. Just like Moses on Mount Sinai who was tending his sheep and then all of a sudden God was present in his midst in a way that is different. My exhortation to you this morning is that when God spontaneously shows up in your life, drop everything and focus on what the Lord wants to say and what the Lord wants to do for you in that moment. I'm reminded of when I was um, much younger. My kids were small children. It was Thanksgiving Day. And my children wanted to go and see Toy Story. And we're standing outside on Thanksgiving afternoon. It's a long line. It's a beautiful Thanksgiving Day. Everybody is wanting to go to see Toy Story. And my children are, are with me. And we're in the back of the line. And it looks like we'll never get in to see this movie. And so we are waiting. But about uh, 25, 30 feet ahead of us, there is a man who is extremely agitated. You could see the anger that was permeating him. And you could see it going off of him. And I have to admit, I was concerned about him. I wasn't sure whether or not this was a nutcase, whether or not this was going to be someone who was going to do something violent. He concerned me. Well, my children noticed him as well. And my little daughter took a look at what was taking place and said, uh, Daddy, aren't we Christians? Shouldn't we pray for him? Now, that's the difference between me and my daughter. I'm thinking about how can I make a way of escape if something goes wrong. And my daughter is thinking about how to pray for him. And so I held my son and my daughter and we prayed for this man. And then after we were done, I was ready to take my children and just leave. <laughs> but my son looked at me and he said, Daddy, aren't you a preacher? Aren't you supposed to help people? Out of the mouths of babes. And I said, son, you're right. So I got out of the line. I had my kids behind me. And I walked up to where this man was. I came up from behind him. Probably shouldn't have done this, but I put my hand on, my, on his shoulder. And when I put my hand on his shoulder, you could feel all the energy leave him. And he became limp and began to sob and cry. Here was a man whose wife was in hospice care. He had been taking care of his wife. And he just wanted a few hours to get away from his pain and his misery and his responsibilities. And he just wanted to see a movie and he had to encounter this long line. And I had an opportunity with my children to talk to him and to pray for him. And I will tell you, as we prayed for him and as we talked with him and as my children loved on him, God's presence was in our midst in a way that I have rarely experienced in my life. In this unexpected moment, God showed up differently. But I think, what would have happened if I had not taken advantage of this moment? Had I not listened to the voice of the Lord through my children? I would have missed it. When God is present in our midst in a way that is different, we need to show up differently as well. So there are times and places God just spontaneously comes to us in a way that is different. 
But there are also times and places where God has promised to meet with us in a way that is different. That he has promised that he would be in our midst in a way that is different. And one of those places we've already talked about is worship. Whether we sense it, whether we know it or not, God has promised to be in our midst in a way that is different. He is here right now in a way that is different. And we also can know that when we come to the Lord's table, that our Lord Jesus Christ is in our presence in a way that is different. So as we prepare our hearts and our lives to take Holy Communion, I simply want to remind you, yes, that God is everywhere. But He is not everywhere in the same way. There are some times and some places where God is present in a way that is different than other times and places. And I will tell you, we're about to enter into one of those times, one of those places, one of those spaces in which He has promised to be here differently. I don't know what your needs are this morning, but I will tell you, Jesus is in our midst in a way that is different. So I invite you to come as you participate in the Lord's table. Come and bring to Him what you need to bring to Him. And be ready to receive His Word. Be ready to receive His grace. Whatever that grace may be for your life right now. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.